Okay, so um, let's talk a little bit about some of our, um, briefly, some of our recent wildfire experiences and in, in, in the setting the context for them. And then uh, I'll, I'll provide some more case studies later in terms of wildfires. So our most dramatic fire um, uh, recently was, I mean, there, there's, there's many to pick from, but, but the one that really was dramatic was the Thomas fire. This broke out in December, early December of 2017. This is a picture in downtown Ventura looking, looking inland. Um, and it just, the fire was just incredibly fast. As with many of our current devastating fires across California, it was wind driven. So this was absolutely a fueled by Santa Ana's, intensified by Santa Ana's, and the damage was absolutely as, as great as it was because of those Santa Ana conditions. Santa Ana winds are something we've had for a long time, but they're becoming more intense, and, they're, and the season of them is, is the shoulders are expanding. So we're getting more intense Santa Ana winds, which are bringing uh, essentially winds from the dry deserts inland of us, funneled out to the ocean through our coastal canyons and, <clears throat> and passages. Uh, we responded very quickly, as we do with many of our disasters, oil spills, etc. So one of the bummers right now is that we're all in COVID, but if, if we were in regular times and a fire were to break out next week, um, after it was safe, we don't want to go into the flames, but after it's in the immediate wake, looking at the monitoring and the after effects, we would be out there. I'd be taking you guys out there. Um, so I'm very excited, not just for COVID to be over for the sake of COVID, but also to be able to get you all back out in the field and doing work. So these are... This is one of our ESRM crews at the Botanical Garden in Ventura um, uh, shortly after the fire, after we were allowed to return um, to this burned area um, in the wake of the Thomas fire. At those flying our drones, mapping the hillsides for the Botanical Garden and all that good stuff. And again, we do this with disasters frequently with oil spills, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> in the case of uh, all these things that we're talking about, um, the skills that you guys are learning in this class, in GIS, in our drones class, in, in all these different courses are really valuable, useful tools. And those are the kind of things that are really needed in the wake of a disaster because people don't have time to learn them and pick them up. Um, and yeah, that's me with my, uh, I had, I had a, operated tendon onto my foot so I couldn't I couldn't walk around too well so I was in a boot so I was not allowed to go outside so then I went outside but that's another story um and so a lot of the tools we build when we are robust and I would invite you guys to consider you know in a couple months once once things are back a little bit to normal at least to consider coming to our aerial and aquatic robotic research team where we build these things we have everything's been shut down for so long i'm sure we're gonna have to rebuild some platforms and refix some things and relearn how to fly stuff but but love for you all to to help out with that um i'll skip this one because we're probably tight on time but i'll just say this is one of our data models this is a virtual 3d model of the beach in carpinteria we flew this with our drones we mapped this with our drones and what you're seeing here on the left as we come into view is the spoils area where we were dumping essentially the debris from the wildfires onto the beach. Um, and so we, we've been interested in documenting the effect on the beach and, and some of our other work. This was a wall that was made apparent in the wake of the Thomas fire. So before we start talking about some of the effects of the fire, I think it's important to say that, that it isn't all bad. There is, some, there is some points of light. There are some points of light in the wake of some of these tragedies. And this was one of them. So this was a wall that was a non-mortared wall. So this was just basically placed by hand. And this was not known before the wildfire. So this was forgotten for about 150 years. People didn't know this was here. Um, and so the fire burned off all this vegetation that hadn't burned in decades and decades. And so we actually discovered this uh, really interesting part of our history in this part of Ventura County. And in this case, this was part of the, the growing of food in and around the San Buenaventura Mission, uh, um, uh, you know, at the time of the establishment of the mission. So that was that was pretty cool. We helped map this uh, uh, for the botanical garden. We also, in the wake of fire, use a lot of tools to try to figure out what's going on, including some of our roadkill monitoring. And in this case, this is a citizen science. This is put out to the general public. Tell me where you saw dead 
dead critters. And so the hotter the color here, there were more animals uh, uh, killed or we, we people reported more uh, dead animals. And this is useful for us getting a handle on what happened to the wildlife in the wake of uh, wildfire. <clears throat> we built all kinds of uh, cool things and cool tools, but um, I think I'll, I'll jump to uh, this first, which is, so we talked about this. And so you guys chime in here and let me know. So is this a healthy community or is this? So this is like going to the eye doctor. Got got A or B? So which one do you think is um, the healthier community? It's The photos are taken from the same exact location or, or just about the same exact location. So guesses, what do you guys think? A or B? Is it B? I would think A, but now I feel like it's B. Same. <laughs> it's okay, so why, why, would you, why would you think A? Because there's like more trees. Right, totally. Right, and that's what we think, right? Like, oh my God, there's more plants, so that's better. More planty, more better, right? More deer, more better, that kind of thing. Yeah, benefit I'm sorry, Holly, I couldn't hear what you said. Oh, it's kind of like, it feels like a trick question because like there's so much more greenery, you think it's right, but then it's like, when is too much? It totally, it totally, totally, right. totally. So this is the answer. So this one with all the trees down here is 1964. This picture up here, this is in the Sierras, this picture up here is 1874. So this we would consider the healthier period. This is where we had more natural fire regimes. And it's more of a sparse environment, right? It's it's more of a, a, a not a whole lot of dense trees here, super dense trees. This inset picture, by the way, it was 1994. That was the last time we could take a picture here, because now there there are trees blocking it, so you can't even can't even re retake the photo because there's too many, you just can't see it. And so what we've we've had here is we've gone from light vegetation to clogged vegetation. Again, here's I mentioned before John Muir. Here's John Muir. It's hard to see in this old engraving from from over 100 years ago, but but this is a horse and this is John Muir, right? <clears throat> and check it out. It's like he's going through a park, or like he's on a road, right? If you try to do that in 1964 or 1994, no way. You couldn't, you know, there's too many shrubs and there's too many branches whacking you in the head. You couldn't you couldn't ride a horse like that through this system. So we've changed our system tremendously. This is much more what it looks like if we go out and walk around, right? All this undergrowth and all this shrub, shrubbery and, and these <clears throat> this vegetative, in, in the context of fire, fuel buildup. Okay, so we have the Thomas fire. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll shift in a second. So the Thomas fire, when this happened again, 2017 was put out in early 2018. It was completely extinguished in 2018, but it started in 2017, late 2017. This was the largest fire on record in California history at the time. And I should say the records here started in 1931. So our first real quantification starts in 1932. But even in 2017, check it out. Nine of the largest 20 wildfires had happened in the previous decade. So <clears throat> we're seeing more and more intense fires and they're larger and larger scale. This is what our landscape looks like here right before the Thomas fire, right? So each of these little uh, uh, color patches on the map um, is a different wildfire. And then the this guy here in the middle, this gray footprint, that's the, the ultimate footprint of the Thomas fire. We lucked out in that our friends <clears throat> In uh, Ojai, basically didn't, by and large, didn't get burnt. Super lucky. It easily could have nuked that whole community. Um, but, but suffice it to say, uh, look where it burnt. It burnt up to the edge of this fire, the Zaka fire in 2017. It burnt up to the edge of the Day fire. It burnt up to the edge of the uh, Hezazita fire, right? So, so the system is burning, and then when we burn the fuel loads get taken down and it's harder for that area to burn at least for a few years or decade or two. So this is absolutely a burning landscape, a burnable landscape, a landscape that knows fire. Um, the other thing to say is 
that when this fire happened in 2017, we were still in the drought. We were, we were getting near the end of the drought, it turns out. But nevertheless, so this is U.S. Drought Monitor. We'll talk about more. We'll talk more about this when we get to talking about droughts <clears throat> in our class. But suffice it to say, the hotter the color, the more dry the um, the more the, the more abnormally dry the <clears throat> area is. White means that it's quote unquote normal uh, rainfall or normal water conditions. Um, so at the start of 2017, a lot of California was leaving the drought. But check out, this is the most intense part, right? So, so this doesn't say how much rainfall you got. This is deviation from how much rain you quote unquote typically get. There's a whole problem with that. We'll talk about that later. But, but, but right, so, so we are in the epicenter of climate change in the state of California, literally, absolutely literally. So Ventura, you know, th this part of Santa Barbara, this corner of, of LA County, we, and, and basically the, more or less the whole of Ventura County, we are in the epicenter of changing climates here. <clears throat> By the time we approached the start of the Thomas fire, um, we, we did get some rain, which is great. And so the drought severity lessened, but again, we were still, when most of the state of California had left that, that really dry time, we were still stressed out. And that's what gave birth. That's one of the things that gave birth to the Thomas fire. Um, when the Thomas fire happened, crazy flame lengths, right? I mean, this is like, like, you know, 30 feet long pillars of flames and they are oftentimes going at at least 45 degree angles. Very, very challenging environment. This is a satellite image, <clears throat> a nighttime image with a light sensor essentially pointed down. And what we're seeing here is uh, the, the, the yellow here is all of the um, uh, anthropogenic light sources. So we have, you know, obviously big LA, look at the giant LA Metroplex is just all solid yellow. This was December 4th. This was December 5th, once the Thomas fire was going. And check it out. The Thomas fire now rivals um, Los Angeles in terms of light pollution, right? So that's the scale at which we're talking about. It happened very, very quickly. In this chart, um, this, this, this is a, a, a time scaled chart. So the colors here correspond to which day of the fire. And what we see is initially this dark and, and then the, so this is in space and this is absolute area extent that burned. What we see here is that the fire ran very fast on this first day. So the, the, the greatest amount of burn area happened on day one, which is crazy. Right, and so this is this fire starts here by um, 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 why can't I think of the college by the um, the college by uh, uh, why can't I think of it the name of the college um, um, Saint Thomas Aquinas Aquinas College, so. So that's where we get the name Thomas Fire, St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, one of the, there was actually two, but one of them started right here and it just ran. So boom, went through all this mountainous area and bam, right into Ventura. Then over the course of the next couple of days, the colors bleed into different colors of green and that's the, the burning. And so what you see is it, 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 it marches back and then it continues to burn. We have another big run here of yellow. But for the most part, it's it's slowly migrating around in these oranges and um, uh, reds. Massive damage to the uh, not just the wildlands or the wildlands urban interface, but actually the tongues of fire and the the spreading of embers and everything uh, did reach uh, surprisingly far into some of our urban corridors in Ventura and surrounding communities. And with so many things with disasters, what we'll see is, is, you know, these guys, their houses were okay. These guys, their houses were gone. And you see this on the same block, right? Or, or, or right next to each other. Once you have a house gone and a house that survived. And that's, that's really difficult. Um, so there's survivor's guilt for the folks that survived. There's, there's people feeling, um, you know, they've lost everything and all that, those stresses and everything. And it's just, it's a very, the heterogeneity is a huge part of, a huge dimension of the disasters as they play out. 
The air quality impacts, as we mentioned, were tremendous. Normally, you don't go surfing with N95 particle masks or things of that nature, but um, that's what these guys were doing because they, they had to get their surf on. This is about three weeks after the start of the fire. There's still smoke in the air. Um, and we had we had all kinds of impacts on our campus proper. So here's our camp. This is um, early on in the fire. So this is here's main campus, CSUCI. And we are getting tanked by all these. And so this is the Thomas fire. And then we had these other fires um, igniting essentially under the same conditions. Not as large as the Thomas fire, but nevertheless still, still fires. So we were getting whacked on campus in terms of smoke and impacts. Santa Rosa, our Santa Rosa Island Research Station was super impacted. I mean, crazily impacted. Um, so all of our campus facilities were being, even our offshore campuses uh, were being impacted by this event. Um, huge, uh, now when we talk about fires, I, I was mentioning to you those, those control burns I, uh, I've been to and, and uh, participated in and things. Um, you know, one of the things I used to do is I, I would bury little temperature probes. And surprisingly, with some of these grassland fires, uh, when you would go down, you know, two, three centimeters down into the ground, you could have maybe not that much of a rise of temperature, as surprising as it seems. The, the grassland fires can go very fast and can go pretty quick and don't get necessarily super hot. And uh, so it doesn't necessarily get super warm under, uh, you know, a, a couple inches of protection into the soil. The Thomas fire was hugely impactful. It it didn't just sort of do one of these ground fires and kind of go around here and that. It was it was like a blowtorch. And in the areas that burnt, um, different from many of the fires I visited, there was massive, you know, complete total burn. Normally, like this tree burns, that tree, most of these trees burn, but there's one over there that kind of escapes, and that little shrub over there escapes. The, that was not that common in the Thomas fire. It was much more complete burning as you see here, which basically all the vegetation is carbonized and, and is gone in this particular example. This is uh, just uh, above Ojai. Uh, we did some quick uh, quick estimates based on, on that and, and some qualitative visits to um, some of the burns and came up with uh, a quick estimate of the Thomas fire. And we think, or, or I estimated that um, we emitted somewhere on the order of 3.6 million tons of carbon dioxide from just the Thomas fire itself. What does that mean? 3.6 million tons of carbon, that sounds like a lot. I don't know, big number, I don't know. Um, and then I have the breakdown here in terms of acreages burned in the, of the different uh, gross plant communities. Um, at the time, when, the, when I made this calculation early, very early 2018, um, it, it takes a while to do our inventories when we do these assessments, right? We have to go through and, um, and, and, and verify numbers and double check. So when we come out with these reports of, for example, carbon emissions from the European Union, from the United States, from California, you know, it takes about a year or more to get that uh, together for the official official numbers to be published. So at the time in early 2018, the most recent data that we had was for 2015 uh, for the whole state of California. And turns out what what this one fire did was emit the same amount or emit 10 percent of all the emissions associated with all the agricultural activities for the entire year for the entire state of California. That's a huge number. Another way of saying it is all the maritime activity in the in California waters in 2015 was equivalent or emitted the same amount of carbon dioxide into the air as this one fire did. This was a huge thing. This was a huge event in terms of um, atmospheric uh, compounds released and and uh, and burning of carbon. Um, other impacts like um, oil seeps caught on fire and we got some money to go monitor oil seeps. Um, here's an example. These are um, <clears throat> uh, uh, active and abandoned uh, oil sites, uh, drill sites in and around the Thomas fire. Um, and it was something on the order of about one quarter of, of our region of the state, one quarter of all the oil and gas wells 
uh, oil seeps were um, potentially exposed in the Thomas fire. Happily, in our visiting of these afterwards, we found only one that's still burning, still on fire. We had feared originally many of them were on fire, but it looks like most of those are were taken care of, which is great. Okay, so uh, so there we are. So we had the Thomas fire in 2017, and oh my God, that was seemed like, and this is another phenomenon we'll see with our disasters. Never thought I would see something as crazy as that. That was insane. You know, what was going on? Crazy, crazy, crazy. Uh, well, then comes another crazy, crazy, crazy. So in this case, we're looking at um, the Pacific Coast Highway. We're in Malibu looking towards, uh, towards Ventura County. And this is the Woolsey Fire. And um, this is, uh, what we see here is PCH has been shut down. So nobody's allowed, except for emergency vehicles, to go towards Point Doom, to go towards Ventura. But coming towards us, coming towards LA, all these cars are massively evacuating from Malibu. We don't think of Malibu maybe as a place that we need to evacuate from. I would say the fire takeaways we can take away from this, how are we doing on time? Fire takeaways we can take away from this is that the world didn't end, as scary as it was and as dangerous as it was and as, as close to disaster as we came, the world didn't end. Um, what we're learning from all these recent fires here in Ventura County and across the state of California is this notion of a fire season for us in California. There's no really no such thing. It's pretty much year round fire. Um, even though all of our funding, all of our systems have been designed to sort of staff up and peak during the, 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 the peak time. Um, and uh, sorry, somebody just called me. Uh, and then and then you know, ramp down. Um, we need different structures. I'd also say we really need to think more holistically and plan for resiliency. You guys are all experiencing that right now with COVID, right? We need to be able to roll with stuff and we keep compounding disaster on top of disaster on top of disaster. In the case of the Woolsey fire, we had the borderline shooting in Thousand Oaks where some of our students, some of our ESRM students were in the borderline when that insane person started killing people. And so we had this huge problem and, and stressful thing and trying to get attention for that. And campus was, you know, going to shut down. And then 12 hours later, we have the start of the Woolsey fire. Um, and, and it goes on and on. So uh, lots of scenes like this. Um, we already talked about this, already talked about the Thomas fire. Um, uh, so we had the Thomas fire and then we had the car fire, right? And so here's another similar story up north. Here's the Mendocino complex fire, another story. The campfire that burned Paradise, California. Um, again, it's, 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 and, and this is happening the same time basically as the Woolsey fire. Um, and here's again, Malibu on fire. Um, now, when I showed you that last slide from early 2018, uh, Thomas Fire was the uh, fourth, or excuse me, was, was the largest fire in California history. This is from the following year. Now, have a look. Now, the Thomas Fire is only the fourth largest in California state history. Now, if we go check it, we're the seventh as of, as of uh, early 2021. Right? So this incredible record-breaking fire is now, now we're in the top 10. And this phenomenon is getting, is, is not slowing down at all. So this is very real. And we need to, to come to grips with this. Um, so I'll play this one real quick. And then we're going to get close to probably pausing here. So climate change, right? So it's important to make sure we're, we're talking about this in real terms. So here we go. We're starting in 1979. And we're tracking atmospheric CO2. And uh, so on the left, it's, it's uh, areas across the globe. And then um, on the right, it's, it's average uh, across um, uh, the years using uh, Mauna Loa, which is the red, which is this uh, monitoring station on the top of the summit in Hawaii, um, which is our oldest, longest continuous direct measurement of atmospheric uh, CO2. And so we're, we're looking at... Um, uh, Sorry, so sorry. Uh, where was it? Okay, so so okay, so so here we go. So we're going up. We're going up. More atmospheric CO two. Now now we're into two thousand and three. Okay, so more and more atmospheric CO two. That doesn't sound good. And so this is the debates that some people would like to draw us into, saying, "Well, that doesn't look that bad, right?" It's, yeah, it's a little more, but is that really causing problems? Yes, 
Yes, yes. Climate change is not a theoretical thing. It's a real thing. We're seeing it manifest daily. Um, and so here we go. So we're about to top, we're about to pause here. We're 2016. We're looking at the 2017 uh, levels now. Now I'm going to change the scale. So now we're going to start looking back farther in time. Okay. So uh, now, now we're looking before I was born. Wow. How old is he? Yes, it's true. It's before. Oh, and then it's really before I was born. And now we're talking, um, you know, uh, now it's the era of the Romans and and Jesus and Muhammad and now we're going farther and farther back right so now we're talking 20,000 years ago 30,000 years ago this is you know this is where we started farming folks and started domesticating crops and all that kind of good stuff so this is the level again the level of atmospheric uh, co2 in this case blue is measured by uh, the gas bubbles in ice cores from Antarctica uh, and and so there we go so the right is where we are again, right? The 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 orange dots. That's right now. So um, oops. So so that's the situation we're faced with, and things are changing faster and faster and faster. So this is what it looks like here in California, right? So the average temperature in California from January through October, which is our fire season, our time when we, you know, can get dry or we're, we're getting into, into the drier and drier times. It's getting warmer and warmer. And we now, so some of the advances we have in terms of um, uh, some of our, our global circulation models and things of that nature have gotten to the point where now we can down sample. So we can start to look at the fine scale, not, not what's the average temperature of the planet, but what's going on in these local areas. And so here's some of that data. So this is um, Santa Clarita. So this is the uh, uh, change from 2000 to 2050, which is only 30 years from now, right? And what we see is um, the summer high is going to be about five degrees warmer. The winter high is going to be about three and a half degrees warmer in Santa Clarita. If we talk about Ventura, three degrees higher in the summer and three degrees higher, right? So, so this is three degrees might not sound like a lot. Huge. Right, huge in terms of uh, the drying of the vegetation, the creating of fuel, all that uh, stuff that we've just been talking about. Again, no shortage of data. What we see is in, in this 2017-2018 era where the Thomas Fire started, where the Woolsey Fire got going, um, we can look at deviation now from um, typical condition. So on this axis right here, I had the average temperature Okay. And again, this is for California specifically during the time of year when we get drier and drier going through these, these months of the year. And this is precipitation. Okay. So more precipitation up here, less precipitation up here. And we have the average precipitation over this period or over the, over the, the, the 20th century and the average temperature over the 20th century. Okay. And so we're, what we see is if we take the most recent years, 2000, um, 2017, again, right before the Thomas fire, is all of this. This is where we are, right? We are above average. And 2018 wasn't the hottest, um, but it was, it was close, right? You know, third or fourth hottest. And this is what we are getting. It's both hot and, so we're both on this side of the axis, and we're below this line, and we're drier. This is manifesting as less snow in the snowpack. And so this is a change from the average condition in 1955 to the condition in 2016 and the change. Red dots are uh, uh, less snow. Blue dots are more snow. What you see is there's way more red than there is blue. And the red dots are way larger than the blue dots on average, right? So that's telling us that we're losing snowpack. Snowpack is how we get our water for irrigation, for growing crops, all that kind of stuff. And here is a, a satellite uh, average composite image showing what you know, historic snow levels were like um, in April and what they were like in 2015. So I remember a couple of times I flew over this area uh, for conferences and stuff and uh, contributing to climate change, by the way. Um, and it, 
it didn't look like the Sierras. It you almost couldn't see snow. And this is our um, our new normal. Again, as we mentioned, this was this condition we have in California was fostered by um, this this absolute propaganda and absolute very clear policy, utilitarian policy of the Forest Service that likened um, fighting fires, stopping fires, not letting wood be burnt to patriotic duty, right? And using all kinds of whatever imagery they could use, racist imagery, uh, 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 jingoistic imagery, whatever, and put this on the scale of war fighting that we had to um, deal with uh, suppressing wildfires. Um, okay, I think I'm going to skip a little bit of this because just we're getting out of time and I'll just finish up with this little part and then we'll come back to this uh, later, which is um, we've been counting on winter rains to help us. Those winter rains um, aren't or, or are unlikely to help us because of um, changing atmospheric chemistries and, and, and in circulations. So this is what we're seeing here. So one of the things that's happening is not only are we drier, but when we are wet, we get intense wet. And so this is the so-called atmospheric river you might have heard of. If you were older like me, this is the, the term atmospheric river has been around for a long time, but it's, it's only recently being used more ubiquitously. It's what we used to call the Pineapple Express. Why the Pineapple Express? Because this is Hawaii. And this is some of our uh, classic uh, deep soaking rainstorms we get in the... Um, uh, winter time in California, where because of atmospheric circulations, we get this very warm tropical moisture coming up, blasting by or nearby Hawaii, comes up and then essentially dumps on us. And it looks like, and, and okay, so this, this composite is the amount of moisture in the atmosphere. It looks just like a river, right? Here's another one. It looks like a big river coming right to California, dumping on us. And, um, and so this means after the fires, we get these intense downpours. Um, and it also is a reason, it also plays into uh, our um, uh, crazy conditions elsewhere in, Cal uh, elsewhere in the US. And so we're getting a distension of the jet stream. And so this is what's helping us. Um, so we have, when we do get water, it's really intense. When we don't have those atmospheric rivers, it's ab we are abnormally dry. And so this is what's going on. So here's the jet stream. And we'll end with this because we're almost out of time for today. But um, so here's the jet stream. It's coming along. Boom, 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 boom. Now, normally the jet stream is going to bounce along right around here, right around the Canadian U.S. border. Right. That's how it typically behaves. And this is cold polar air. And this is warmer, uh, more temperate and tropical air masses down here. But what's happening because of climate change, we're getting all this strange behavior in the atmosphere. It's not just about moisture and this and that. We're seeing the destabilization of our atmospheric circulation such that we're getting these wide sinusoidal waves. And so instead of the jet stream basically going this way, right, basically being like a bowl or a semicircle, it's getting these wide disturbances, these, these wide deviations. And so what that means is instead of instead of getting our occasional rainstorms from up here, we get nothing. We have this high pressure system that sits here and keeps rain clouds and, 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 and rain filled um, atmospheric packets from getting to us at the same time. So normally the jet stream goes east or goes west to east. What we're starting to see frequently, and we're seeing this right now, for example, here in the US, the jet stream is actually shooting down. So going almost north to south in the US and, and, and cutting us off, not, not Canada from mainland US, but cut, count it, cutting the west off from the east. And so while we are dry and, and abnormally warm, this is where we're, North Carolina is getting snow, South Carolina is getting snow, New York is freezing because it's the same phenomenon. So this phenomenon that, that, that's keeping us from the, the cold winter conditions is bringing hyper cold winter conditions to this part of the country. Um, and with that, I think, uh, I think I'll pause. I'll pick up our story again um, after this. But... Uh, uh, Suffice it to say, there's a lot of interesting things we can learn from what's, what's going on in California and what has been going on in California. And we'll pick this up in a, in a bit. Thanks for tuning in. And before I totally log off, 
any questions about that stuff I just ran through, uh, you guys? Anything you wanted to ask me as we were uh, quickly jamming through that stuff? Um, I just thought of one thing. Yeah. Um, on that last slide that you were talking about. Yeah. Um, do do you we really know like exactly like how climate change is changing the atmospheric composition? Like we know it's changing, right? Mm -hmm. But do we know like why the jet stream is being warped the way it is or not, not fully. I mean, I mean, we, we, we see the pattern and the pattern is showing up more in our global circulation models, but as to be able to predict it, like, is it going to happen next year or, or, or how intense will it be next year of things of that nature? We don't, we, we don't have the, um, we have the computational power to show that this is more likely to happen, but we don't, we don't, we don't quite understand it that much. Um, so this was something that, um, again, like all these things, this has happened before. This isn't completely unique. What is different is the rate and frequency, uh, the intensity that this is happening. And so we're seeing this with things, um, uh, um, things called the blob, a, a sort of hot water masses in the ocean off of our coast. And so we're, we're not, we're not fully able to totally understand them, but it is quite clear that the conditions that are leading to this destabilization are fostering it. And so what I mean by destabilization is as our atmosphere gets hotter um, and uh, warmer, it can actually hold more moisture per, per uh, cubic centimeter of, of atmosphere, per, 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 per volume of atmosphere. And that more water means it can hold more thermal inertia. And so it can hold essentially more energy uh, in in the atmosphere, and that energy appears to be partly related to why these why we're getting really deviant, uh, you know, cold cold and hot hot masses. But as to as to how that happens exactly, I don't think we we really fully um, get it. We can describe the pattern when we see it, but we we don't exactly get it. It's it's similar to El Nino. So El Nino, we've we, we know happens every typically seven to 11 years or so, um, a return rate. Uh, and, and we can describe what's happening and we, we can see the, because we monitor this stuff, we can see the polar vortexes starting up. We can see El Nino starting up, but as to whether, as to us being able to say, Hey, next year, right. Are, are we going to see an El Nino or not? Or next year, are we going to see a really persistent polar vortex or not? Um, you know, persistent deviation in the jet stream in the wintertime in the northern hemisphere, and and we're not we're not quite there yet. Um, so we definitely know it's a it's a it's a signal of climate change in this more unstable atmospheric system, but we're we we don't uh, um, fully understand it. Does that help? Yeah, thanks. I was okay, just, cool. I kind of figured that was the answer. Was <laughs> that was my long professor way of saying I don't know. <laughs> I'll take it. Awesome.